What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Ninja Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, this story came out some time ago, Brian, and we didn't discuss it. I have been thinking about it, though. I'm sure you have as well. And some of the things that are rearing its head right now in terms of rumors, in terms of decisions that perhaps Marvel may have to make, Brian, regarding Mr. Jonathan Majors and the allegations that are pending, I guess, because he hasn't been, um, what's it called, uh, exonerated from that, correct? Not yet. Everything's still pending. So, Brian, Kevin and the Parliament find themselves in a very sticky situation. Your thoughts on this whole thing and uh, what do you think could happen? Well, so it's still, there's still some TBD. We don't have full information. We have, uh, he was arrested in connection with a domestic dispute with a woman that he was with uh, in New York. Uh, as part of the Creed 3 promotion. Um, there are reports on both sides. I think Major's side has come out and said, hey, we have a text exchange showing this, there was nothing happened. We got the woman's side saying she was treated at the hospital for visible physical injuries. As you say, you know, we have not, you know, ch charges that we haven't gone to trial. We haven't got like, there's a lot of things still to be determined here. So to be clear, it's not it doesn't appear necessary that marvel takes action yesterday to address this they can afford to wait and see like maybe the charges get dropped maybe there's some misunderstanding we haven't heard about so that's a little still up in the air right um but it doesn't look great in the sense that well first of all i mean it doesn't look great for jonathan majors like this is a guy who had he had it, man. He he ha he has it all in his palm right now. When you look at his the reception to his performance as uh, the sort of the antagonist, call it in Creed Three. He's not a full villain. Yeah. Reception to his performance coming off of Loki, and even in Quantum Mania, he is clearly viewed as the the shining bright light, consensus wise, in a movie that has otherwise been mostly rejected and already forgotten yeah. by audiences. Yeah. And then also you layer on like other roles that he had signed for other performances we haven't seen yet on the independent circuit. That's there's supposedly like a almost I think it's like a bodybuilding weightlifting yes. movie that he's got coming out that's got a lot of awards buzz on the on the festival circuit. So this is a guy who like you know a month ago we're sitting here he's thinking, all over the place. Like I said on this show, like he doesn't win multiple Oscars, something went wrong. But the Achilles heel when if you're Marvel of having one guy carrying as much responsibility in your face and your multiversal saga is if the one guy decides to pull the Ezra Miller playbook <laughs> out and put that into effect. And I'm exactly. not saying he did that again. We don't know, exactly. but at least the question, there's a little bit of a shroud hanging over this of like, well, what if, what if there are felony charges? What if this goes somewhere? Yeah. What does Marvel do? And the short answer is they got to make a change, but I don't know how that works with this. Brian, I think the measure to which they will determine what actions to take will be uh, from the reception that we get from Loki. Uh, also, Brian, strangulation, those words aren't usually heard quite often, Brian. These are serious allegations, strangulation. When I heard that, I said, uh-oh, those are words that don't easily disappear. Disney has a lot invested in Jonathan Majors, and whoever is in charge of fixing that whole situation has a doozy in front of him. I don't think we need to have a conversation yet about his possible replacement if they decide they need to go there. But I think we'll have to know how Loki does and how it is received and also determine how this case um, it gets thrown out or whatever. We got to see what happens with that as well. 
Yeah, I agree. Let's put it this way. It's just one more potential headache that Marvel didn't need at a time when it is having a lot more questions than answers regarding where the, where these, you know, where these projects are going. And this, this guy above all was really the one, as we said many times, that the multiversal saga and its resolution was counting on. We were like, he, this is the given. He's the, he's the guarantee. We're worried about the heroes, we're worried about this. And, you know, we never even talked about the possibility that they might actually have to make a change for reasons off screen. So let's hope it doesn't come to that. But, you know, it's not great. And I think the other tricky thing, as we always see with this, becomes a little bit now. I guess if you're looking for a silver lining, would be that this news hit after Quantum Mania came out, in the sense that he was able to do the promotional press tour for Quantum Mania without having to answer the questions. And like Loki, I don't know. Like Loki, it's a season two. I, there'll be some press interview circuit, yes. no question. But you know, with Hiddleston and Owen Wilson, they can probably carry, carry it. it for him. To where they don't need him as much so in that sense maybe marvel dodges a bullet in the immediate term but gosh man i, I really hope we're i mean i really hope for his sake that this is this is some there's a piece of information we haven't heard and this doesn't lead to um you know a, a major setback or a downfall to a career that looked like it was set to take off into the stratosphere yeah let us know in the comment section below um, what you guys think of this whole situation and what possible steps Marvel may be thinking about. Obviously, you have to... <sighs> you know how people are these days, man. And it, it just, the whole situation just doesn't look good. And so let's see what happens there. And on top of that, Brian, this is something we've spoken about some time ago as to what needs to change. Bob Iger certainly said those sentiments, had those sentiments about a change needing to happen with quality being the priority instead of quantity. What strategy does Kevin have? Because now he his domain now is 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 the way he's chosen or has chosen directors, and that is a very interesting thing, Brian. Because I, I I think we had spoken about how they used to do it and where Kevin has gone and how he did gets his directors. What are your thoughts on this uh, rumor about changing his strategy about how he who he picks as the directors? Yeah, no, it's really interesting because. And again, this 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 connects to the ongoing discussion we've been having about the Victoria Alonso dismissal and the VFX issues that Marvel has been increasingly having with these more recent projects. So one of the things that the Alonso situation, I referenced this on a prior show, is kind of brought to light, if you believe some of the stuff that's going around, is this idea that one of the reasons Marvel was comfortable plucking unproven directors was the idea that they had the visual template under their control yeah. and that no matter who was behind the camera marvel the machine was going to take over and post and do all the vfx and handle all the special shots and like they didn't need someone who had experience or a viewpoint or a capability with the pure visuals to pull these projects off and for a while, it seemed like that was working really well. Like dating all the way back to phase one, they had a lot of success picking directors who hadn't done massive, I mean, even John Favreau back in the day. Yeah. It's not like John Favreau had directed five $200 million films before Iron Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we think of him as like, wow, he, he handles big budgets like it's nothing. But like, that wasn't the case in 2007. Mm -hmm. And then you lead forward into, you know, James Gunn with Guardians. Right? Yeah. That's a guy who had been small, small scale stuff. And all of a sudden he's doing Big cosmic stuff. for them. And it looks great. And it works great. The Russos come off of TV. And they, of course, go on to have the most success of all. So this is a formula that became tried and true. Yes. But has really come under fire in phase four and five, where we've seen... Um, 
Now, I think especially kind of really starting with Chloe Zhao on Eternals, where yes. it, that's where it felt like you really started to have the conversation. Because I think, I mean, Shang-Chi, people brought up the CGI with the dragons and the creatures yeah. and, you know, the, the, the Talo. But because the movie was generally well received, Destiny Nobody Crane cared. didn't yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. really get the heat yeah. for that. It was still viewed as like, well, this kind of feels very Marvel. Yes. But with the Eternals is where it felt like you had this auteur director and then people were just really underwhelmed despite having very high visual expectations about the project. And since then, every film has felt like people just go in looking for the flaws and come out crowing about the flaws and the flaws become, the visual flaws become a, their own storyline in all these films. Yeah. It started with Chloe Zhao. Um, and you had said, Brian, that there was a better movie in the editing room there. A better, there was a better movie there. And I guess Kevin started, it, it was at that moment, I think, perhaps that Kevin was starting to give a little bit more leeway to directors. And hence... Brian, I've said it throughout our conversation. If you've been when he, if you've been here with us, that Kevin is letting people do their thing, as long as they stay within certain parameters. You know what I'm saying? But overall, that I don't know. I, I I don't know what he's um what strategy is he going to be a little bit more overlord now, Brian? Or what do you, what do you think is he going to do? Well, I want to, I do want to highlight one point, which is I think Eternals is where I felt like it started to take on a life of its own. But if I were being fair, I think the issue was starting to surface even when Marvel was at its peak. Cause I think Captain Marvel, if you go back <clears> and watch that movie, that early fight scene that's kind of in the dark, I think looks terrible, yeah, 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 yeah. terrible. And I even think in Infinity War in particular, the Iron Man effects compared to like Iron Man 1, were already starting to get a little more, like with the suit kind of just covering his body at the push of a button versus him actually getting it. It was already starting to look at the edges to me. Like when I go back and rewatch that, I'm like, you can sort of see like the CGI is getting a little more cartoonish at that point. More the, lazy. But, yeah, that's good enough. That's good enough. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But the story, the momentum was so high that we just kind of forgave it. So I think if we're being fair, and then I think back to the movies where it doesn't bother me at all. And I think one of the things that does stand out to me is we, when we were less cosmic and we were more street, it made it a little easier. Like one of the reasons like Winter Soldier, I think looks so good. is like, y you don't have these crazy colors of the quantum realm no, or outer space. Like you just, you, you can shoot on set in a city and like, you're just counting on hand to hand choreography for the most part. And that looks good to me. Yeah. For the, so I wonder if like in their quest to go to space and go kind of beyond and go, you know, go cosmic and extraterrestrial, was that a bridge too far for the visual capabilities or what they had in hand? Because, you know, this isn't, this isn't James Cameron, right? Like we, it's, and it, and it, it's not fair to compare them to James Cameron because no, James Cameron not. takes 13 years to make one movie. It's like, yeah, it's going to look good because that guy, but what it does underscore to me is James Cameron is his own VFX director. He is the engineer of what you see. And none of the Marvel directors, if we believe this setup, none of the Marvel directors are that. They mm -hmm. hand it off to the machine and the machine and the VFX crew basically make the movie look the way it does. And there's been a breakdown there, which has led now to this report that Kevin Feige is looking maybe at more established directors for future projects so he doesn't have to be as hands-on. But that, Pablo, reminds me more of the Warner Brothers old DC approach, doesn't it? Like where they used to, they handed Zach the keys. They handed James Wan the keys. They handed Patty Jenkins the keys. Right, so that can work. But as we saw, that's also not exactly guaranteed gold every time out. No, certainly is not. I mean, listen, I think the visual effects is just that laziness. 
and just basking in the glory that was MCU. And people, I guess at that point, not really caring about what it looks like or, you know what I'm saying? So I totally agree with that. I I think they took the audience for granted. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, all of these projects show that. Brian, look at the Mandalorian. Tell me that that joint doesn't look glorious. Tell me that when you're looking at that, Brian, I was, and we'll get to this. Yeah. I'll just say this. I would pay to go in a theater to see an episode of The Mandalorian each time. I was just about to say, episodes five and seven of this season, I found myself, and parts of Andor, I found myself regretting that there was no big screen option. For some of them, which makes me excited for the film that they're they're putting together. But no, you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the care taken in putting these shots up, which goes to the on this VFX thing where it's like, we're now hearing that the way these things were storyboarded and like you go back, I love watching the making of the movies program. I think it's fantastic because it is magic. And like, mm-hmm. when you go back to like George Lucas crafting Star Wars, like the detail of the storyboarding, the detail of the imagery before you even get to building a model or, or, or a CGI effect is so intricate mm-hmm. that I would think as an artist, that's incredibly helpful to be like, this is what the director has in mind. And now I can embody that. If what we believe, what we hear about Marvel is true, none of that exists anymore. They literally just hand the artists yeah. like a one-line directive. It's like Spider-Man swings through city, and like they have to then use their own imagination, imagination. to create that. And it's like that is tough. That risky. Yeah, that's risky. Yeah, that is tough. Yes. And, and if they're doing six, seven, eight, if all these projects are jammed up against each other the way we know they were. That's where you're gonna get slippers because they're like, I don't have time. Yeah. I'm not getting paid enough, and that's wow. when you get what we've been getting. Interesting, interesting things we've mentioned, Brian. That I hope that there is some improvement visually and more care taken in what world they want us to really believe in that they really deliver on those things because my friends all you have to do is look at mandalorian and it's like we can do it we can do it why can't we do it that show looks amazing but anyway the push pull though mm-hmm. i want to stay on this point a little okay. bit if you don't mind because i remember because if they do this i can see the conflict coming already where if you're going to bring in a director who has a decided visual flair, yeah. like a real personality to the style. You still have an interconnectedness here that has to kind of work. Correct. And, you know, if you give directors that degree of autonomy and you have this calendar that you have to meet, you can already see where some of this could get a little, a little hairy. Like I, you know, we talk about Zack Snyder a lot. And one of the things I do find interesting about I go back and watch the behind the scenes of Man of Steel and even even like BBS. Cause I remember Ben Affleck talking about it and I was like, oh, well, Affleck's a director. He kind of has an interesting perspective. And I remember him describing, he was impressed by Snyder's creativity in thinking through angles for set pieces. Like he's like, he's like, I'd watched Zach put the shot together and then I'd watch the finished product and I would be like, wow, I never thought to put the camera there or I never thought to swing and move around. And it just like has always stuck in my head of like, like him or hate him, Zach has a very strong visual reference point for what he wants to show you. Yeah. And that's exactly what Marvel actually is seemingly looking for here. Yeah. But to do that doesn't mean your budgets get smaller, that's for sure. Yeah. And it might mean sometimes you got to give the director the time they want to have a shoot be what they want have the edit and the post be what they want i i don't know that marvel totally allows that or can allow that with what they're trying to do here so i'm fascinated to see how far kevin is willing to go in terms of bringing in someone seasoned and just saying i trust you to develop the visuals and execute your vision but not go so far out of bounds that we can't use it yeah 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 broader yeah. MCU. They certainly have a difficult task in front of them, Brian. Um, but it'll be interesting to see 
when this implementation takes place for what piece of content because we as we already know there are some movies already coming out guardians of the galaxy marvels and uh <laughs> yeah and there's uh, there hasn't been really others i mean obviously we're waiting for fantastic four and some other films but perhaps those will be the films that would that will even blade i don't know about blade but let's see uh but, i think it's fantastic four because at this point to be fair the marvels was shot already yeah guardians was shot already yeah to expect that you're suddenly gonna get world's different vfx on those projects that's not realistic those are done pretty mm -hmm. much but fantastic four hasn't been cast or gone before the camera yet to me and that we know that's very space we talked about on our other show whether they bring in surfer or galactic that's the one to me that will be a test as to whether they've actually learned anything yeah. and are going to do anything different with how the project looks yes let us know in the comment section below because big changes are coming they have to come yeah and it's and, and like in that same article that's out there there's a reference to something we kind of speculated on after quantum mania bomb which was was jeff loveless we sure we want him writing kang dynasty and now we're kind of hearing a rumor that he might not make it to be writing kang dynasty so writer changes director cha like it's all in flux. That's amazing, Paolo. Yeah. How quickly <laughs> this cookie crumbles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it'll be very interesting these next uh, six months uh, because they have a lot riding on ne these next set of films, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what Kevin puts in play. But let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of all this. Um, remember to hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time on the Nigerian Report. You blew it. You blew it.